There's not been a lot to laugh about in Northern Ireland over the last 40 years. The old mantra for God and Ulster has a new twist these days. The fact that it's now possible to make a joke about it is a sign of the changing times in Northern Ireland. And yet, in many respects, Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland, remains a divided city. The physical evidence is there for all to see. It's not the first time that walls have been built in Ireland, you know. They've been there for 400 years, you know. And walls aren't just uh, built of bricks and mortar. They're, they can be built with legislation and laws and, you know, prejudice. I think for a certain generation it is a wall of shame. I'm not going to justify anything else. I love my country, I love my culture, and that wall is staying where it is. Amen. The modern history of Northern Ireland has been dominated by one thing, the Troubles. A violent, bitter conflict, both political and religious, between those claiming to represent the predominantly Catholic nationalists and those claiming to represent the mainly Protestant unionists. Broadly speaking, the nationalists, also called Republicans, want Northern Ireland to be unified with the Republic of Ireland while the Unionists wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, along with England, Wales and Scotland. Well, I think this conflict was principally about hatred. Hatred of a people, hatred of my community. And I think it has taken Republicans to realise that with hatred you can achieve nothing. It was about people's civil rights and human rights. People went out and marched on the streets and were beaten off the streets. And then the British Army came in. The Catholics and Nationalists here actually had no basic human rights, they had no voting rights, they had all those rights taken away from them. But in 1998, Northern Ireland's political parties signed up to the Good Friday Agreement, breaking three decades of deadlock. It established a power-sharing assembly and paved the way for the withdrawal of British troops and the disbanding of paramilitary groups. After many false starts, the Assembly assumed its full power in May 2007, and the sworn enemies of yesterday, Unionist leader Ian Paisley and the Republican leader Martin McGuinness, became First Minister and Deputy First Minister. But what Northern Ireland has now is not so much peace as an absence of conflict. Far from disappearing, the walls have grown. Instead of reconciliation, there is partition, an ill-tempered stalemate of separate identities and separated lives. There's huge amounts of segregation in daily lives, particularly within working class communities. Kids go to school in different schoolings, Catholic schooling or Protestant schooling. They would, they would, would just not mix. That's not a consequence of the wars. I mean, the wars, the segregation and the divisions were there before the wars happened. The wars kind of fed into that, and then the further segregation has continued from that. So we're now in a situation where there's more segregation after 13 years of the peace process than there was during the conflict. Segregation is a fact of life. It's a fact of life whenever we've had 35 years of trouble and mayhem and people aren't going to get over that very, very quickly or very easily. The first of the so-called peace lines began as a length of barbed wire, rolled out by the British Army to separate the warring communities in 1969. From then on, they became more common and more complex. Today, there are believed to be 41 deliberate barriers across Belfast. We estimate that about half of all the barriers have either been built anew or have been extended or enlarged or heightened in some way um, over the last 10 years, over the course of the peace process. The 
most notorious barrier was the one between the warring communities of Protestant Shankill and Catholic Falls Road. But the flashpoint of recent years has been the wall that separates the Short Strand, an isolated Catholic enclave in East Belfast from the surrounding Protestant areas. In 2002, it was the scene of the worst riots in the city since the start of the peace process. Sean McVeigh, a Catholic, lives with his family in the shadow of the Short Strands Wall and has vivid memories of what happened. There was widespread riot and, and attacks on this small area of Short Strand, East Belfast, and a lot, most of it was concentrated just at this particular spot because this was seen as a, a vulnerable spot and the wall was low at the time. The houses here where we live, the whole roofs, every window, upstairs, downstairs, were smashed, destroyed. There was loads of fireworks and petrol bombs and all, and stones and balls getting thrown over the wall. And windows and all were broken, cars and all were damaged, and people were hurt, and then our windows and all were covered up. So everything, it was really dark around here, and it wasn't the same as what it used to be, but it was. Greta Abbott lives with her family on Cluan Place, the other side of the wall, on the Protestant side. I actually moved in during the Troubles in 2002 because um, a lot of the people in here had children and were elderly and they were put out by the people next door and we needed people to move in here that weren't afraid to live in here so I up sticks and I moved in. So my daughter, she was hit in the head with a brick. And that was just in the alley over there. She's just sitting there, minding her own business, play, talking away to her wee chums. Jesus Christ! The wall here between the two communities has become the focal point of this conflict. This is not a spat between neighbors, but the battle line of a war between two traditions, two denominations where an us and them mentality still exists. They nearly killed us. What, what can we do? The police don't stand up for us, and we did send for people. They come in, they attacked them back, they went home, and that, that's it, finished. They have to be shown that we're not by ourselves, that other people are there ready to come in and protect us. They have a sense of insecurity. They've had it for 400 years here. They still feel that they need the wall to, to keep their foothold in Ireland. They have got away with getting their own way for the last 10 years from the, the ceasefire. And they have, the government has give, give, give to them all the time. All the time. They want to squash our culture. Our politicians have no choice but to go in the government with murderers, jailbirds, all sorts. The bitterness felt by the Protestant majority in Northern Ireland has been compounded by the feeling that their own politicians have let them down. They've tended to be tribal leaders rather than statesmen above the, their own communities. And they defended their own community's interests as opposed to looking at the broad, broader needs of, of the wider communities. The difficulty again is within staunchly loyalist areas or staunchly republican areas whereby they feel a sense of betrayal um, because their politicians said that they would never share power with republicans for example um, and all of a sudden in a very short period of time a deal was done and they were sitting side by side laughing and smiling. To me that's normal politics but to a lot of our, our communities here that is uh, a step backwards. Even today, politicians in the new Northern Ireland Assembly still occasionally seem locked into their old mindsets. We've got Republican ministers administering British law, swearing an oath of allegiance to British Crown forces. So ideologically, I think Republicans know that they actually lost that war. And what they have to do is now come to terms with that. Jennifer McCann is a member for the Northern Ireland Assembly in West Belfast. She represents the main Republican Party, Sinn Féin. 
Under a mural of Bobby Sands, the first Republican to die on hunger strike in prison, she points up the gulf that still exists between her and her Protestant colleagues. I don't think Republicans were ever defeated, and certainly I think that, that, um, that anyone, any Republican that I know that is, is in this process and everything else, that they are taking this here to their end, the end goal. I mean, I've been part of the Republican movement for my 14 years of age. I'm now 47 years of age. I'm still a Republican. I've still got my long-term um, goal as a Socialist United Ireland. But this is not a version of future events that the Protestants subscribe to. They think that they're going to get this as part of United Ireland and there'll be another war before that ever happens. It is this absence of trust dating back centuries that has kept the walls of Belfast in place. It's not the first time that walls have been built in Ireland, you know, they've been there for 400 years, you know. And walls aren't just a built of bricks and mortar. They can be built with legislation and laws and, you know, prejudice, you know, so I think we'll have to break down the, the, the walls of prejudice you know, first before you can take down the physical walls, you know.